2023 is going to be the year of congestion pricing, AVs, EVs, and data and technology. And AVs are right up there because they see that there's an opportunity to come into the marketplace. This is Transit Unplugged. I'm Paul Comfort. Good to be with you on the second edition of Transit Unplugged for 2023. And today is a great episode because in addition to a wonderful interview with Matthew Dows, our newsmaker interview, president of the International Association of Transportation Regulators, uh, we're also going to start a new feature of the program, and that is a focus on leadership. Over the last year or so, on our every other week, what we had called our News and Views show, we were including a future public transportation segment. We talked about what's going on in the future of public transportation and where I might be uh, signing books or speaking, et cetera. And we may still do that from time to time. But in its place, we're going to bring a regular uh, component, which will be on leadership development. So many of you have told me the role that Transit Unplugged has played in your life and in your career uh, some a friend, couple friends of mine in Florida who have moved up recently in their positions in their career said they owed it largely to uh, listening to this podcast and the impact that the interviews with our transit leaders had on their lives. What better way to learn about what's happening in the industry, what it takes to be a CEO and a leader in the industry, than to hear directly from other CEOs and senior executives who have done just that. But we're going to add to that component now a new feature where we talk to leadership development experts. That's right. People who are consultants, uh, who have their own companies that do leadership development. We're going to ask them what it takes to grow your career. What are some of the key leadership skills and attributes? And how do you build them? How do you grow them in your own life? And today I'm excited to kick off that feature with Dale Walls, the founder of Lion's Guide which is a leadership development company. Uh, He's a good friend of mine. I've appeared on his podcast as well. And Dale's going to kick us off. And then in a couple of weeks, we'll have Lawrence L. Harper on, who is a trainer. And then we're going to bring you um, a great uh, interview I did with Euless Cleckley, who is the head of Miami-Dade. He actually at the Florida Public Transportation Association conference, uh, I asked him to kind of do a stand-up talk on leadership uh, for a CEO roundtable we're doing. And we're going to take the audio from that and air it for you. We'll have some other great um, great leaders and leader, uh, leadership developers come on the program and talk about that. And hopefully you'll enjoy that. Let me know what you think. If you like what you're hearing on Transit Unplugged, let us know. Click a like on whatever platform you're on and share it on your social media and with your um, fellow employees and, and colleagues at work and at home. Uh, let them hear about the great work that you think is happening here on the podcast. But first now today, let's also take a look at our headline news for this episode. Some two really interesting stories that are based on hot topics right now. As you know, um, the number of bus drivers across the U.S. is a big issue. Many transit agencies are wrestling with not not being able to attract and retain their bus operators. Well, one transit agency in Memphis is uh, trying a unique approach. The Memphis Area Transit Authority is partnering with a company called Tutris Child Care On Demand. And they're providing a new child care benefit in order to attract employees. The benefit will include a $200 per month in financial assistance toward this. And Matter Working Parents now have access to the Tutris platform, which will enable them to quickly search, vet, and enroll their children in real time. Uh, This company has over 185,000 licensed child care providers on its nationwide network, and they provide parents options, which include for full-time or part-time care, drop-in care, after-school programs, summer camps, and care for non-standard hours, an important option for drivers with night and weekend shifts. My good friend, Bakara Malden, Deputy Chief Executive Officer of MATA, said, we're proud of the valued service our team provides to Memphis with over 5 million passenger trips each year. And by partnering with Tutris, we're appealing to a new generation of workers who care about the community and want to work for an organization that cares about them. That's a great uh, approach, I think, and uh, we'll see if other folks do it, and we'll let you know as we continue to stay in touch with uh, with Bacara and with Gary Rosenfeld, the CEO there, how that's working. Is that helping them to attract new drivers and uh, new employees there? And now we move up north to the United States, to Boston, to a story out of the Boston Herald from this last week uh, related to the COVID vaccine. The story reads that eight employees who were fired for not complying with the MBTA's vaccine mandate, MBTA is the um, acronym for the Massachusetts Bay Transportation Authority, who runs the transit system there, those eight employees will be given the opportunity to return to work 
following the T's decision to remove the pandemic era restriction. The MBTA rescinded its vaccine mandate uh, on December 2nd, 2022, according to a memo sent to employees by outgoing general manager Steve Poftak. In the memo, Poftak said, we now know This is a quote. We now know that being vaccinated does not prevent an individual from contracting or transmitting COVID-19, unquote. And the letter cited updated CDC guidelines regarding identical quarantine and isolation protocols for vaccinated and unvaccinated individuals as the reason for removing the policy. So MBTA spokesperson Lisa Battiston said, as a result of the vaccine policy being rescinded, eight previously non-compliant employees will be offered an opportunity to return to work if vacancies exist through a negotiated settlement agreement with their respective union. The eight employees are all bus drivers and members of the MBTA's largest union, the Boston Carmen's Local 589. They are not currently slated to receive back pay. Well, that's a look at headline news on today's episode of Transit Unplugged. Now stay tuned for our interview with Matthew Douse, president of the International Association of Transportation Regulators. And then later in the podcast, our new feature on leadership development with leadership expert, Dale Walls. Thanks again for being with us on Transit Unplugged. I'm Paul Comfort with Matthew Doss. Matthew currently serves as Transportation Technology Chair at the City University of New York's Transportation Research Center of the City College of New York, where he conducts research and continues to be extensively published as an expert on ground transportation regulation and technology. Mr. Doss also continues to serve since 2009 as president of the International Association of Transportation Regulators, a nonprofit educational peer group of government transportation regulators from around the world, promoting best regulatory and innovative practices. Mr. Doss is also the longest serving commissioner, chair and CEO of the New York City Taxi and Limousine Commission, where he served from 2001 to 2010. He's currently a partner at Wendell's Marks. Lane and Mittendorf LLP, where he founded and chairs the Transportation Practice Group since 2010. Matthew, I can't believe we haven't had you on here before, man. You're I the know. man. I know, um, but better late than never. I'm psyched, <laughs> and uh, it's it's really good to see you and, and your listeners. And congrats on your book, by the way. Um, Thank you. I'm, I'm still, you know, getting through it, but uh, very excited for you. And it, it needed to a story that needed to be told about equity inclusion. And, I think it's it's going to have a lot of uh, positive repercussions for policymakers. So uh, thanks for taking the time to do that for the community. Yeah, absolutely. And we're excited to have you on the podcast. We're, we've actually had quite a good focus on New York City. We had, uh, you know, the um, president of New York City Transit, Rich Davey, on at the end of last year. We've got you on this week. And next week is Catherine Rinaldi, CEO of Metro Trains North and, and uh, Long Island Railroad. So a great focus on the Big Apple on the show. A lot going on. Um, I met Rich uh, uh, before, and I'm excited for the energy he's bringing uh, over from, uh, I think he's coming from Massachusetts. So um, we're excited excited to have him here and hope, hopefully we'll get some meaningful change at MTA. Absolutely. Well, let's talk about that. Let's just dive right in. Um, sure. So tell us a little bit about the work you're doing and uh, how it will impact and improve public transportation across the, in New York City, obviously, but you're doing work internationally and across the country. Yeah, I think there's two things I'll bring up. And obviously, congestion pricing is on everybody's minds in New York. That's Everybody's looking at that now. And I have two hats that I wear, um, one that is new. I'm now chair of the Transportation Law Committee for the New York City Bar Association. The wow. Bar uh, Association gets very involved in some of these issues. And, um, you know, we opine on, on legal issues. It could be cameras in the subways, uh, you know, uh, construction on the BQE. Um, it could be as gritty as that, or it could be as broad as what we just completed with the ITR, and it's on our website, uh, www.iatr.global. Our group is a group of taxi and TNC and commissioners from all over the world, but it also includes public transit agencies and transportation departments. It's a very unique group, and our fi- our focus and our mission is uh, multi mobility, uh, multimodal mobility innovation for all. We've gone beyond you know taxis and TNCs and Ubers yeah. and Lyfts existing on an island. But we're looking to try to integrate with public transit and with with the data platforms. And one of the things that we just put out is uh, congestion uh, mitigation principles, guiding principles for policymakers. Ten points. Giving a presentation to your be on it, but it's on the front page of our website if you want to see it. And it talks about the things that policymakers need to do to tackle congestion. There's no one size fits all solution here. You know, you you can't just 
wave, wave a magic wand and do congestion pricing and the problems are going to go away. You need to look at a lot of different things. And, and, and that report kind of delves into that issue. I think a lot of people don't realize that pre-pandemic, um, New York City represented 40% of the total transit ridership on a daily basis for all of America. There's other hot topics that I'd like to get your opinions on, Matthew, and that is when it comes to the driver shortage, uh, the role of taxi cabs and TNCs. Uh, it's very important in this. I recently just returned from a trip to Dubai where, where taxi cabs are integrally involved in the public transit system. They're actually you know, up on the screens through their mobile data terminals so they can be dispatched by the transit agency. Uh, what is your thought about uh, the driver shortage and the role of taxi cabs, TNCs, et cetera, in helping to, um, to mitigate that? Uh, by the way, I, I've been to Dubai many times and I, 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 it's an interesting system. They have they and Abu Dhabi and uh, have a franchise system where the government has their own taxi service and they compete with franchises they give out and they have a data room like I've never seen anywhere else talking about public data for yeah. years now that you could see every cab in the entire city where it is what it's doing that's right and you don't really yeah. have that in the US but I it, just it, just FYI what's great about that is my company trapeze is the one that makes all those mobile data terminals in every taxi cab all 11,500 in Dubai it was fun to I, sit there and say hey that's my that's my logo I, up there I love them and, and you know there's some issues like you know they're way advanced on automated enforcement too like you yes. even know you're getting a ticket and you can get five tickets for speeding and there's no cop around they have cameras everywhere but that's interesting an advanced governance system like Singapore as well. Um, I was in London. I was in Manchester, Ireland. I was all over the world this year, honestly. I came back from Kyoto, Japan, not too long ago. Everywhere I go, there's a driver shortage. This is a universal thing. Okay. It, it has a lot to do with, um, you know, labor trends, like even in hotels. Like, you know, there's a lot of people went back to their countries to claim their checks from the government, you know, during the pandemic. There are a lot of people that just gave up. And in, in the U.S., our big issue, Paul, was in, in the industries that I'm involved in, like the four hundred ground transportation, buses, school buses, motor coaches, taxis, limos. It was very dis disenchanting for a lot of these drivers to get a check from the government that was more than their original paycheck. This, I think, got a lot of drivers to say, what am I doing this for? This is a tough job. You know, whether you're taking school kids around or, uh, you know, uh, if you're a private bus driver or a taxi driver, you're dealing with the public. And you're not getting paid a lot of money, so why would you go back? So I, I think that plus the insurance, a lot of independent contractor drivers in the industry, they couldn't afford to maintain the insurance when there was no work. So we just saw people leave, and the trucking industry has been dealing with this for years now. There's been you know a lot of people are trading out, and I I don't know what the solution is here. Honestly, I think there's a big truncation taking place. I think there's room for truncation if a company's going to go out of business. They're going to get more efficient. You see Uber partnering with taxis in New York to try to, you know, hold on to their labor force and get more drivers uh, involved in, in what they deliver because they have a cap on the number of cars. So, I, and I think you're going to see people, there's already people recruiting and it's hard to recruit for a job like that. I mean, it's one thing to drive for a limo service where you can say, hey, you can, you know, you can take, uh, you know, Liam Neeson around today and, and Sylvester Stallone tomorrow, and, and you could be dealing with really important, fun people. But, you know, getting folks to do a job where they're earning much less money and dealing with a, a you know, population of folks that, um, you know, uh, can't afford to pay, like the Sylvester Stallones of the world, um, you know, which is a very limited niche market, it's hard to make it an attractive job because you drive around all day. You have to be on the road, you know, um, you know, the maximum amount of hours to get a return. And it's just a tough job. And, and you know, some of the cities have been doing gas surcharges and um, uh, I think fare increases like they just did in New York, which will help, you know, uh, and there will be a period of time when the ridership goes down uh, and it recovers. But the, the prices are going up and up and up. And I think we're going to see more of that, more consolidation, less companies around in the coming years in all sectors uh, on the private side. And, um, you know, that's kind of like, there's really no, no, no end in sight other than, you know, retooling operations, trying to make the job pay more. Uh, but when you do that, passengers have to pay more and that's it's right. gonna, yeah. you're going you're gonna to lose some riders for good. Um, and it, where they go is anybody's guess. Are they going to ride mass transit? Right. Are they buying a bike? Or, I mean, who knows? Yeah, they buy a car. Well, I mean, that remains to be seen. The modal shift 
Yeah. Is- well, it makes me wonder, and I'm interested in your opinion on this. Is that why you think there's uh, been a, a a very fast uptick, to be honest with you, in the last six months on the use of autonomous vehicles? Uh, in taxicab fleets and other places, especially in some cities out west. Talk to us about that. Yeah, I think the AVs are smelling blood in the water here. I think they're saying, hey, you know, we're, we're, they're deploying like wild San Francisco, uh, Arizona. You could take a driverless Waymo one in Phoenix Airport right now. There's nobody in the car. Nobody there. 2023 is going to be the year of congestion pricing, AVs, EVs. Um, and, you know, data and technology and AVs are right up there because they see that there's an opportunity to come into the marketplace. And I think people are going to be talking about it more and seeing that it's really here. I don't think it's pie in the sky. I really don't. Whether it, it succeeds as a business model, right hill versus like uh, what with, what they're doing in, in Trenton and Contra Costa with micro microtransit shuttles. And I think... Both are being tested. We'll see how it prevails. But the technology and the public acceptance of it, I think we're going to get major strides in that area now because of the deployments in California and uh, in Arizona and possibly elsewhere, you know, Florida and other places. It's really happening. It's here. So um, I think all of these changes post-pandemic have uh, have led these companies to speed up their deployments. So we're talking about yes. deployment now, right, Ellie? We're not talking about testing as much as we did, you know, four or five years ago. So it's going to be a big year for automation, in my opinion. Absolutely. I know we could continue to talk for quite a while. Maybe we'll have you back again sometime soon. I wish you the best as you do your presentation uh, at TRB. That's the week this episode will be airing. And um, we look forward to continuing a conversation and potential collaboration in the future, Matthew. Absolutely, Paul. It's good to see you. And thanks for having me on. Hi, I'm Alea Carey a communications consultant who loves working with public transit agencies. New hires and promotions are part of any organization's life, to the extent that the ways we communicate personnel changes can get kind of boring. You know, the old executives on the move theme that's both obligatory and usually ignored. What can you do to really engage your audiences when you communicate organizational changes? First, anybody can read a resume. What kind of story can you weave to make your readers interested in why you've decided to place this employee as you have? Interview your employee to find details about their work or life experiences to show they're prepared for this moment. You should also keep your values in mind. How does this person align with your most important organizational beliefs and intentions? Using the opportunity to remind your audiences of your values Try to communicate two or three specific values this employee's work will support. Finally, what can you do to keep your news relevant? Is there a current project this employee will work on or something your agency's been lacking and needs to address? Maybe there's a story in the community news that you can peg your announcement to. If you'd like to talk more about communicating personnel changes or anything else related to communications and public transit, look me up on LinkedIn. My first name is spelled E-L-E-A, last name C-A-R-E-Y. Thanks for being with us as we continue on today's episode of Transit Unplugged. This year, we're going to begin a new feature, and that is on every other week, we're going to have an outside speaker who is an expert in leadership come in and talk to us about leadership in the industry. Most of our listeners are uh, you are mid-level to upper-level executives or people in the transit industry or government And many of you have told me at um, recently, I was just at a a conference a couple months ago, and uh, one of the one of you came up to me and said, Paul, you know, I just got promoted to this new job. And it's largely because I listened to the podcast, because I was able to integrate the information you provide with best practices and leadership stuff from your guests. And it's really helped make me a better leader. And I thought, why not really just focus and drill down in on leadership? And so in order to do that, uh, our first guest is a good friend of mine, Dale Walls. Dale is the founder of Lion's Guide. And uh, Dale, welcome and thank you for doing the program today. Yeah, no, it's an honor. Happy to be here. Thank you, Paul. I've been a guest on Dale's podcast as well. Uh, Dale, tell us about Lion's Guide and a little about yourself. 
Yeah. So, I mean, a little bit about me, um, I guess Lions Guide's really my second mountain. You know, I first mountain in business, uh, leadership at least, was a company I founded called Corsica Technologies that ended up, that was an IT services company, ended up being one of the best in class in the nation. And uh, I grew that to about 200 people before I finally uh, exited that company after selling it uh, about 18 months prior. Um, and, uh, you know, when I exited that company, uh, getting into Lions Guide, I was just, you know, really, I was I was trying to figure out what I wanted to do. And I was looking back at what what did I love doing? Well, I loved, you know, especially when my company got to the stage where I was leading leaders. You know, my role then certainly as the CEO was a visionary and and all those things that come along with the CEO. But man, the, the favorite part of my day was when I was doing my one-on-ones with my direct reports. I was leading the team meetings, leading town halls. And, you know, just kind of while I was figuring things out after, you know, I exited the company, um, you know, someone kind of hit that, hit me with that and said, hey, Dale, you ought to be talking to other people that are starting businesses or leading organizations because uh, they can learn a lot from you. And I, at first I was like, yeah, you know, thanks for the compliment, you know, whatever. And and then and then I slept on it and I realized like, yeah, I, I love doing that. And if I could continue doing that, man, what do, what do they say? You know, you're, you don't, if you do what you love, you don't have to work another day in your life. And I, I love that. I just love helping give leaders, business owners, entrepreneurs, some perspective, you know, uh, that they, that I, I help them find their own answers, to be honest with you. So that's good. Well, so you're in basically leadership development full time now. And that's why I thought you'd be a perfect first guest for this, because that's really what I want to do with this segment of the podcast. We're heard now in 130 countries and uh, the folks that are there, I want their influence to grow. I want them to become better leaders. I want them to do a better job at what they're doing. And I know you focus on three key components, courage, clarity, and leadership. So as you would talk to um, a mid-level transit manager you know, in Kansas City, let's say, what would you tell them today? I, look, I, I think it's when it comes to courage, clarity, and leadership, you know, when it comes to established clarity, you know, I say we have to lead ourselves first, you know, and that's what I try to, the number one tenet of leadership is setting the example, right? Your people are not going to believe the messenger if they are not going to believe the message if they don't believe the messenger, right? So, um, so it starts with us, right? We've got to level up. Leadership is hard. And for us to level up, one of the first things we need to do is establish clarity. Uh, what does that mean? That's that's the vision. That's your own knowledge. That's operating in truth, right? So as far as vision is concerned, like what, how do you see yourself? Who do you want to be? How do you want to show up? How do you want to interact with people? What makes you successful? Um, you know, what is your you know, vision for the day today? What's your vision for the day tomorrow? What's your vision for this week? I mean, a, a key element of leadership is you know, you're you're the one carrying the flag. You're you're leading the team to a some sort of vision. And I, I feel like you need to have both a vision for yourself as well as a vision for your team and organization where you're going to go. Um, additionally, the, the second part of clarity is just knowledge, right? A lot of times when we're stuck, it's, it's because we just don't know something, you know, and, and, you know, as leaders, we get stuck often. So another part of established clarity, clarity is just that, like, we have to be competent, you know, we have to be knowledgeable and are we going to have all the answers? No, but you know, when we hit those points where we're stuck or unclear, we we've got to check in and realize like, there's something I don't know here and we need to seek knowledge and the other part of that is also seeking truth, right? You know, how many, you know, one of the oftentimes things we see in failures of leadership is communication, right? We're going off misinformation or we're making yes. assumptions. Um, so one of the things in this area of clarity I, I talked to people was like, you know, in addition to vision and knowledge, you need to operate in truth, right? You can't operate on hearsay. You can't operate on assumption, uh, you've got to seek truth, be an agent of truth, and don't make assumptions, right? As much as possible. Some You're going to have to make a call sometimes, and you might not have all the answers, but you need to really work hard to make sure you're operating in truth, you know, as far as uh, the things that you're doing. Let me, let me ask you to, to dive in on that just a second. One of the big complaints that I've heard in uh, larger bureaucracies and organizations I've been involved in is, I never know what's going on. People aren't communicating to me. It's not clear to me what's happening. My passion, I'm a communicator, so I probably overshare. <laughs> so when I've been in positions of responsibility, I tell them, this is what we're doing and this is why we're doing it. Is that important, do you think? Absolutely. And because we have the curse of knowledge, right? When we're, when we're the ones in charge, you know, we, I've never we know heard it called all. that before the curse yeah, of knowledge. And, and I'll tell you what that means, right? We have the curse of knowledge. We have all this information in our head and we walk around like everyone else 
can see what the heck's going on in our head. And yeah. it's the furthest thing from the truth, but we still operate as such, right? Um, so when it comes to clarity, it's not only just clarity for yourself, but making sure your team's clear. And and one of the and, and so you need to communicate. You have to communicate often, you know, in appropriate channels. And 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 you need to seek feedback that affirms that your clarity is has been gained, right? When you're when you're communicating with your team or your direct reports or whatever. Hey, so tell me what you just heard, right? Like when I was working with direct reports, so, so tell me how you're hearing that because they're going to say something back to you, and that's going to tell you real quick if you guys are on the same page or not. So it's it's an important. You know, and all at all levels, whether it's your direct reports, you know, or just a team or organization, communications got to be tip top. And what do you mean by courage? So let's move from clarity to courage now. <laughs> you know, courage to me, you know, courage is rooted in success. And 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 how do I? How I came to just be a part of telling people that is that I kind of reflected one day. I said, you know. The times I've had successes were the times that I acted courageously, right? And the times I had failures were when I let my fears get the best of me. You know, what does that mean? Like, you know, I joined the Marine Corps. Now, I didn't follow like my father and grandfather or anyone else into the military. Like some stories are, not all of them, but some stories are I joined because my dad joined or my grandfather served or whatever. I joined because it was something different and I saw it as a path. But that took a lot of courage to go... Yeah, sign me up for the Marine Corps, you know, and and let's go as an example. But that, that opened up a lot of opportunities, opportunities for me. It got me out of my small town. It got me a career in IT. It got me a leader, my first roots in leadership training, frankly. Um, but to me, you know, courage equals success. And when it comes to uh, courage, we need to understand that courage is a virtue. And what what does that mean? It's like when you're acting courageously, you're choosing the greater good over a lesser good, right? It's meaning, uh, here, here's another way to put this. You know, we go to all these organizations and they got their core values on the wall. Yeah. And one that's always there is integrity, right? Like what organization not go in? What are your core values? Like integrity is going to be in the list somewhere. And that's nice. What do we know integrity is? Doing the right thing, even when no one's looking. That's to me, a pay to play, you know, core value. Everyone, we that just needs to be. We don't. You shouldn't even have to put that on the wall anymore. Like, if you don't have integrity, you don't belong here. Uh, let's let's reserve that space for some more bigger, <laughs> meaningful things. Aspirational, yeah, yeah, aspirational goal. But um, but one of the things in this area is I go. But if if integrity is doing the right thing, even when no one's looking, I tell people like courage is doing the right thing, even when everyone is looking. That's good. I like because that. because that takes courage, yeah, right? Man. But but we're talking about. We're talking about the right thing, okay? Not, not not being bold and courageous. You know, there's some nuance there. Courageous is about virtue, doing the right thing, it, going for the greater good. I mean, I could go in a local bar and pick a fight with the biggest dude in there, and that's pretty bold. But there's no virtue in that. There's there's nothing courageous about. There's, there's no good, right? And that's really the difference of, ah, of courage. I like and, that, and why that's important. You know, um, and 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 people always talk about like being fearless and, and all that it's there. We, I don't care if it's the professional athlete or the actor on the stage or whatever, like none of us are operating without fear, but we are operating with is courage despite those fears. Um, and so I, I, I hang my hat on this because a lot of things that are holding us back to be great, great leaders, great producers, whatever the case may be, are our own fears, you know, they're the things that are holding us back. And I, and I, I preach this and, and I think, you know, one of the things with regard to courage and clarity and how they intermingle is, you know, I talk a lot about the uh, courage and clarity success loop. And what does that mean? Well, the more clarity you get, right. The more things that you can see, the more knowledge you have, right. What is that doing when you're gain when you're establishing clarity in all these areas, it's giving you confidence, right? Like if you know what's around the corner, you're going to go around the corner, right? You know, and, and, you know, the more clarity you establish, the more confidence you get and the more confidence you get, well, the more courageously you're going to act, right? Because what do we fear? We fear the unknowns, right? So that's why courage and clarity to me are like really tip top in trying to instill kind of like a success philosophy on some of the, just the way I've, I've learned things. Yeah, that's good. Um, and let's uh, spend a few minutes then on just the overall topic of leadership. You know, when it comes to leadership, it's something that to me, uh, 
when I was in Marine Corps boot camp and we were getting, you know, we would we do some classroom training and so so that we would get a ton of lessons on leadership, leadership traits and principles and different stories of leadership from from past engagements and things like that. And, you know, here we all were, we were just recruits. And, you know, I remember someone just kind of asked like, well, why, what, you know, we're not, when we get out, we're not going to be in charge of anyone, you know, we're just going to be privates, you know, when we, when we went to the fleet Marine Corps and, and the response from the drill structure was like, Hey, regardless of, if you're a private or PFC or, or general, and, and whether you're in charge of other people or not, you're, you're always in charge of yourself. Mm. And these leadership traits and principles and the things that you'll learn around leadership, um, if nothing else, they always apply to you, right? I, I've got friends that go, Dale, you're the most self-disciplined person I know. Well, self-discipline is just self-leadership. That's mm. all it is, right? You, I mean, we talk, when you start throwing around words that define yeah. leadership because leadership, uh, Flip, my leadership director, we, we often joke like, leadership's like the force, right? Whether if you're a Star Wars fan. Yeah, yeah. Like it's everywhere and it affects everything and it's good it, it's good and bad, right? Um, and so leadership is so key that we need to know that we have to lead ourselves. So when when we throw things around, what is leadership? Well, it's the vision, it's building the systems, it's the culture and the mindset and all those things. Well, all those things on our own personal goals, our own personal objectives, like that's all we're doing for ourselves, right? We're establishing a vision for ourselves. We're setting our systems up, right? All those things that we do as leaders of a team is what self-discipline is, right? It's it's us leading ourselves. So yeah. It's 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 across the board, really really important. That's good. It's uh, I don't know if I heard it in a movie or where I saw it, but uh, I remember somebody saying, you know, you want to change the world, draw a circle and start right there. Draw a circle around yourself and start right there. Well, you hear you hear people say like, you want to you know make things better, start make your bed, right? I mean, that uh, <laughs> admiral go, made, right. had that speech, right? Yeah. And, and you know, make your own bed, start there, clean up your room, clean up your house, make your yard and. And I guess one of the biggest things in in leadership is just setting the example, right? Even when you're leading yourself well, what I found, especially with clients, and and I work with folks over a number of weeks and and month to month and stuff, and usually by four or five, six weeks in, they'll come back and go, you know, my wife or my husband, they started doing X, Y, Z because I was doing it. I was like, yeah, because you're leading yourself well, and that's contagious, right? You're when, you know, Everyone is a leader, and, and, and I'll tell you why. Your power of influence is going to do one or two things for other people. What you're doing, the people closest to you, the people that care about you, you're going to do one or two things. You're either going to be enabling them or you're going to be giving them permission. And what does that mean? Well, if you're doing good things for yourself, you're going to enable them to do good things for themselves as well, right? They're going to see your example and they're going, wow, look how that's working for Paul. I want to do that, right? It's the whole Roger Bannister four minute mile thing, right? They see things that are possible, they'll start yes. doing it. Or you're going to give them permission, meaning if you're being mediocre, you're being lazy, you're procrastinating, you're you're not leading yourself well, even you're giving them permission to do the same thing, right? And, and you and I both have kids and and you know, and teens, and I can't imagine it not being the case in almost any situation where you're around people and they're looking at you, they're looking, looking at you from the side or looking up to you, whatever the case may be, you're influencing them some way. You're setting an example for them and you're either enabling them or you're giving them permission. That's great. Dale Walsh, thanks so much for spending a few minutes today with us, sharing with our listeners, um, you know, leadership tools, leadership tactics, appreciate the work you're doing and thank you for sharing with us today. Thank you. We hope you're enjoying this episode of Transit Unplugged, the podcast. How would you like to see behind the scenes footage of the agencies that Paul visits? Then be sure to check out the new Transit Unplugged TV on YouTube, where transit evangelist Paul Comfort dives into the culture, the food, and the transit of major cities around the world. You'll see the operations control centers, how maintenance shops work, and the latest innovations taking place at agencies around the globe as we work together to improve the lives of our transit riders and our communities. Be sure to subscribe to Transit Unplugged TV on YouTube or at transitunplugged.com.
Thank you for listening to this week's episode of Trends and Unplugged News and Views with our guests, Matthew Dows and Dale Walls. Next week on the show, we have Catherine Rinaldi, president of Metro North Railroad and interim president of the Long Island Railroad. If you have a question, comment, or would like to be a guest on the show, feel free to email us anytime at info at transitunplugged.com. And don't forget to head over to transitunplugged.com to sign up for the newsletter. So you're always in the loop with whatever's going on with the show. So until next week, ride safe and ride happy. <laughs>